Hello, welcome to another lecture on web services. Uh, today, we are going to talk about uh, web service extensions, uh, some of those uh, that can be used on top of services using SOAP and uh, Whistle. And uh, before we uh, get to those, uh, let me just remind you of uh, what we already know. So we already know SOAP, which is the uh, transport protocol for XML data uh, exchanged between applications. Um, SOAP is used for the message syntax and uh, it abstracts from the individual transport protocols such as um, HTTP, SMTP or some uh, other messaging services. And uh, we also talked about WISDL, which is uh, a machine readable document describing um, an interface of a web service. And uh, you have also come uh, into contact with WISDL already uh, in the tutorials. So um, by now you should be very familiar with uh, the individual parts of WISDL and, uh, and their meaning. <clears throat> Now, um, one, uh, one uh, particular feature of WISDL or a property of WISDL is that it includes the uh, service description with the endpoint um, URL. And uh, that means that basically um, the services described by WISDL are static. So you spin up the web service, you have the WISDL file, you share that WISDL file with uh, your partner who then we'll call the web service and uh, that's it. Since then, the web service cannot change, it cannot move. And uh, basically uh, you need to uh, establish the, uh, the communication channels uh, before you actually start using them and then they are fixed. So uh, that is a rather static uh, setup. Um, let me remind you of uh, also this slide, which uh, depicts what we will be dealing with uh, during this course, this semester. And uh, we are still in the W3C style web services. Uh, that's the first column. And uh, we reviewed XML, we uh, introduced SOAP and uh, WISDL, which uses XSD. And today we are going to talk about the red part. Those are the other technical uh, documents. Uh, and we'll see how, um, or we'll see a couple of specifications which deal with particular uh, problems that are not solved yet in uh, W3C style web services using SOAP and WISDL. Um, those other uh, specifications, they are exactly what is uh, later missing in RESTful web services, because um, one of the huge advantages of the W3C style web services is this big ecosystem of standards uh, which are applicable to various kinds of problems. We'll see a couple of them addressed today, uh, but this part, this ecosystem of standards is what is missing from the RESTful web services. And uh, the first web services extension that we will talk about is uh, web services addressing. So again, it is a web standard, W3C uh, recommendation, but note that uh, this one is actually backed by uh, some big players such as uh, Microsoft, IBM, SAP, Sun Microsystems, and so on. So the, all these uh, big players are actually using W3C style web services, and they felt the need to uh, address a specific problem they are having. And um, uh, they came up with this uh, web standard for web services addressing. Basically what it is, is a, well, transport neutral mechanism to address web services and uh, messages. Uh, what it can be used for uh, will be um, quite clear in the next slide where we'll have a, a example. Um, basically it allows the client sending a web services message, a SOAP message um, to uh, establish or include some desired routing information in that message. And this information then can be dynamic. It doesn't have to be uh, like known before uh, in, in design time. The, the routing of the message can be established using web services addressing in runtime. 
And for that, um, Web Services addressing basically deals with two types of constructs. One is an endpoint reference, description of a Web Service endpoint where a message can be sent, and then some uh, message addressing properties, which we'll see in the examples. And here uh, we can already see uh, a SOAP message with uh, a couple of new SOAP header blocks, and those new header blocks are Web Services addressing specific. What we can see here is, for instance, a message ID, which is a unique uh, IRI. Each message using web services addressing will have a different unique um, URI as a message ID. And then reply to, and that's an endpoint reference or an example of an endpoint reference. Basically, it just contains the URL of uh, an endpoint. But what this says is, and again, note that uh, those fields are filled in by the client of a web service and by the initiator of um, the message exchange. Um, it contains an address to which um, the server or the web service should reply to. So no normally with SOAP and Whistle, you as a client would send a message to the server and the server would send you the response and that would be it. But here we can see that we can actually specify that the response should be sent to someone else, to some other, uh, to some other endpoint. Now, the two element here contains uh, the ultimate receiver in terms of uh, the SOAP message path. So that's the intended receiver of this particular message. And then uh, we can see the, uh, the action um, here, which is a bit different from the SOAP action that we have seen before. This is the IRI of a message in a Whistle interface. So IRI of a message definition. So it says or points to a Whistle file to its interface and to a particular message that is um, what is being sent in this SOAP message. So uh, we can see a couple of, uh, couple of header blocks. We can see the endpoint reference. Uh, we can see the link to the expected semantics of the message, which is described in some whistle and the ultimate receiver. There are, of course, more, uh, more possibilities uh, that uh, Web Services Addressing brings us. We have seen the two uh, uh, endpoint or uh, the two uh, ultimate receiver designation. Then we have seen the reply to endpoint reference, but we can also describe uh, using the same mechanism uh, where the message comes from and uh, where the possible faults should be sent to. So again, uh, we can have one endpoint reference for re uh, receiving of the replies to the message and maybe another endpoint reference for receiving uh, faults. So again, a more dynamic way of um, exchanging messages. So then we've seen the action and the message ID. Um, when there is an exchange of multiple messages, for instance, one is a reply to another, there is the relates to um, element, which can contain, for instance, uh, ID of the message um, to which a reply is now being sent. Uh, and finally, uh, there are so-called reference parameters. Uh, this is something that can be speci specified in an endpoint reference. And the content is not to be processed. It is just to be uh, copied into each message sent to that uh, endpoint reference. We'll see an example of this a bit later. So there is another example. Here we have another message ID. We have a uh, reply to endpoint reference. We can see that two here is a uh, mail to URI. So this message is probably going to be sent uh, via email. Um, and uh, we can also see a body. So this is just another example of a SOAP message utilizing uh, web services addressing. Now, uh, the endpoint uh, references uh, can be used to um, dynamically address the message. So uh, they do not have to be defined beforehand. They can be defined uh, in runtime. So in runtime, you can decide that you will spin up another web service, for instance, and include the endpoint reference to that web service into a SOAP message being sent um, instead of um, negotiating uh, all the whistle descriptions and uh, all the uh, service locations beforehand. So this actually brings uh, a little bit of uh, dynamic uh, to uh, the message exchange. Now, the endpoint reference contains an address, which is an absolute IRI. We have seen that uh, with 
an HTTP based endpoint and a mail to based endpoint. Um, and there are two special, uh, special URIs defined for an address. One is um, anonymous, that's uh, for, well, endpoints which can be located by uh, an IRI. So if you describe your endpoint in some, some other way, um, then you can use anonymous here. And uh, the other one is none, which uh, means that uh, no message should be sent to this endpoint reference. Uh, then there is some metadata and the reference parameters, parameters which are supposed to be copied into each message being sent to, um, to that endpoint reference. We'll see that in the example right away. So now here we have uh, an actual endpoint reference and uh, we can see the address. It's an HTTP address. Uh, we can see some metadata describing where is the whistle describing that endpoint and um, the URI of the interface within that WSDL file, uh, which is being implemented by that uh, addressed uh, endpoint. And then we can see the reference parameters. Those are application specific. In this case, it is some customer key and uh, shopping cart ID, uh, for, for instance. And those are to be copied into each message being sent to that, uh, to that endpoint. So the example of the message, can be seen here. So uh, we see the SOAP envelope and the SOAP header, and the header contains some header blocks. There is the web services uh, addressing two um, element, then some action, and then we can see that the reference parameters from the endpoint reference are actually copied as individual header blocks into that message. And to designate that those header blocks are actually the reference parameters uh, according to uh, web services addressing, there is this special web services addressing um, attribute is reference parameter set to true. When a header block in SOAP has this parameter, it is known to the application that this is a reference parameter uh, based on uh, web services addressing. So this is how a message using web services addressing can look like, including uh, the reference parameters. Now, the remaining question is, where, where do we find the endpoint references? So the endpoint references can be either standalone, so it is an XML file that we can find somewhere, or uh, they can be included into other XML documents. For instance, WSDL. Uh, here we can see a WSDL service definition, and within that service definition, uh, we have the web services addressing endpoint reference with all the attributes needed. In this case, only the address, but uh, you can include anything, anything there. So this is yet another thing we can find in a WSDL file. Remember that uh, in the WSDL file, in many of those bind uh, of those um, of those uh, concrete uh, definitions, uh, such as uh, operations bindings and uh, services. Um, there is a place for binding specific information and all these extensions can go in there as well. So here we have a whistle file extended with a web service addressing endpoint reference. Uh, we can also uh, see how uh, the web services addressing action URI is actually defined in a whistle file. Remember that in the endpoint reference, we are referencing a whistle file and uh, an IRI of uh, a message uh, in, uh, in that whistle. Uh, and this is how we can, uh, that's the web services action uh, URI. And uh, this is how the IRI can be assigned to a message in a whistle file. So here we can see the input and output. And on that input and output, there is again from the web services addressing namespace, uh, the action IRI specified. Well, so this is in brief, the web services addressing one of the uh, extensions um, that can be used with, uh, with SOAP and its headers. Uh, it can be used for a more dynamic way of addressing messages in W3C style web services. Well, let's move on uh, and uh, we'll, um, or I'll introduce you to another extension which is used 
uh, with W3C Star Web Services, and that is Web Services Security. Um, what it deals with is basically three use cases. One is authentication. When the web service server needs to know or wants to know who actually sent, sent the SOAP message, and uh, when the server wants the client to prove uh, their identity, they can use web services security for that to do it in a standardized way. Another use case is confidentiality. So, um, um, so this deals with basically encrypting parts of the message so that those parts cannot be seen in transit. Uh, and the last use case is integrity. So detecting changes or preventing changes in the message again in transit so that uh, the server can be assured that nothing happened to the SOAP message in transit. Now, why uh, we need uh, a standard like this when we have HTTPS, right? So um, one point is that HTTP and its secured variant is only one of the transport protocols that can be used with SOAP. There can be other protocols such as uh, email or other messaging services which might not support encryption, for instance, or integrity checking, uh, such as HTTPS does. Um, so that's one point. Another point is that actually, remember that uh, with SOAP, we are also talking about the SOAP message path, where we have many intermediaries uh, on that path. Uh, and the message goes from one intermediary to another, possibly using HTTPS. So uh, here, the point-to-point -point security is, um, is established, that's fine, but uh, web services security actually aims at the end-to-end -end security. So um, it aims at establishing authentication, confidentiality, and integrity um, on, along the whole SOAP uh, message path. So not only between two nodes, but from the uh, sender to the ultimate receiver. So uh, we'll take a look at how this is achieved uh, using web services security, which again is an extension. So it will use some SOAP header blocks to, uh, to achieve these goals. It is actually a big set of st individual standards which deal uh, with individual parts of uh, security be because that's a big topic, right? Uh, so uh, there is this uh, basic basic uh, specification, uh, the core specification that deals with uh, the basically SOAP headers. And then for each individual type of SOAP header blocks um, and uh, use cases, there is a sub-specification. So for instance, there is a specification for uh, username tokens. So how um, a username token should look like when you want to authenticate using username and password, for instance. There is a whole specification for that. If you want to authenticate using a binary token, there is another specification for each type of the binary token, and so on, so on and so forth. Here, I will introduce just some examples. Um, and uh, we'll start with uh, uh, the uh, SOAP header block again. So here, uh, all the security basically happens in a SOAP header block called uh, security. So now we already know uh, about SOAP roles and SOAP must understand attributes. So I will not get back to those, but uh, as we add more and more SOAP header blocks, uh, you can imagine how those might be uh, relevant to, uh, to be specified because uh, various intermediaries may deal with uh, various um, techniques or technologies using various header blocks. So there we need to specify correctly the roles and the must understand attributes. But that is what we dealt with um, last time. Um, so now let's focus on web services security. So it will all happen in the web services security header block. And um, of course, if, there, uh, if we are going to talk about encryption, that will uh, affect the body as well. Uh, but we will get to that. Let's start with the authentication use case. So for that, uh, let's say that we want to uh, authenticate 
uh, using username and password or using a binary uh, binary token. So how that might look like for a username and password pair? Well, one of the options is just to specify a username token with the username and password as text, just like that. Um, if the server has a list of usernames and passwords, it might um, be convinced that uh, this message was sent by uh, the user identified by the username with that plain text password. Of course, this way of doing that has some obvious disadvantages, such as the password being visible. Uh, so this can be done, but only when we have a point-to-point -point, uh, security established. So um, when basically uh, we know that one web service and the, uh, uh, the, the client and the server communicate using HTTPS, then it might be okay for some, uh, some applications to use a uh, plain text password like this, uh, but in other cases, this is um, insufficient. So, uh, and uh, someone might be uncomfortable with uh, showing their password in plain text. So this is insufficient. What can be done is instead of uh, password text to use a password digest. Um, and let's have a look at uh, how the digest might look like. Um, it could be a hash of a password, but uh, that would again be insufficient because anyone could uh, use this hash instead of the password and again, fake um, the, the message. So that's, uh, um, or fake the sender. So that's insufficient. So what can be done with it? Well, two, two things. One is that a timestamp will be added saying when the message was created and that timestamp will be used um, with the password to create the, the digest, the hash. Um, but like that, the message could be actually replayed by an attacker. Um, so that's again, not uh, enough. What needs to be added uh, once again is um, the nonce value, which is a unique value. Nothing else than a unique value. So now um, the, the password and the nonce value and the created timestamp together is being hashed and uh, encoded using base64 uh, as a password digest. Now this requires the server and the client to actually maintain a list of the used nonce values so that they can know when um, a message is being replayed uh, and detect this. But uh, this is actually what is being implemented in uh, web service security. So this is one way of establishing authentication um, in web service security using username and password. Another uh, completely different uh, way of um, establishing uh, authentication is using binary tokens, such as those we know from asymmetric cryptography. So for instance, a public key uh, or a certificate or something like that, uh, that's a binary token. And again, there is a specification of, uh, that says how such a binary token should be included in um, a um, web, uh, web services message. Um, note here, the WSUID uh, attribute, we'll see this one later. Uh, and it is used to actually reference this binary uh, security token in other places of, uh, of the message. And I already talked about the tokens being base64 encoded, which means that those are really binary tokens, but uh, each six bits of data is represented by a um, ASCII uh, character. Okay, uh, let's uh, briefly talk about how we can actually reference those tokens. So one way of doing that is a, a reference using a URI, and this URI may be either local within a document, or it can be an absolute URI referencing a token published somewhere on the web. So we can have, for instance, our public key uh, published somewhere on the web, and we can reference it using a URI. So that's a, that's a reference. And another scenario here is um, identifying a, for instance, a key using a ad identifier. This, of course, presumes that uh, the client and the server, or actually the client and the ultimate receiver, 
they have a pre-shared key and this is the identifier of the key. So in the message, they will indicate which key to use to, for instance, decrypt the message, um, but they will not include the key itself. They will just reference to it and they will assume that the key is pre-shared. So they both have the key and this is the name of the key to, uh, to, to be used. So those are two ways of um, referencing some binary uh, tokens. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, uh, so this leads us to the, the second use case of web services security, and that is uh, the integrity. So we all want to make sure somehow that the message is not changed in transit from the sender to the receiver. Well, since um, we all know how this can be done, right? We, we need to digitally sign the message and this ensures that the message uh, is not um, changed in transit or when it is changed, we can detect it later when we digitally sign it. But uh, let's get a bit technical here. So how do we digitally sign uh, this, uh, this message when the message is obviously an XML document? Well, there is again a standard for that. There is a standard AW3C recommendation that deals with uh, digitally signing XML documents. Um, but it is not um, an, a straightforward uh, process because we can all imagine how we can digitally sign a typical uh, text document, right? We hash it and we then sign the hash and uh, that's it, we have a digital signature. And when we change the uh, text document, then the hash changes and the change can be detected. However, in XML, this is not so easy. Uh, why? Well, um, an XML document is not a regular text document. It contains, um, oh, uh, the, the problem is that many different textual representation of an XML document actually convey the same meaning uh, in um, terms of XML. So if I have an XML document, it can, for instance, contain um, tabs, as white spaces, or it can contain uh, spaces uh, as white spaces. From the XML point of view, those documents are identical, but on the text level, they are different because uh, different white spaces are used. So that's one of the problems, but uh, there are also other problems. For instance, in XML, um, the order of attributes on an XML element is not defined. So I can state the attributes and their val values in any order I want to. And it means the same thing, but it differs then on the text level. Uh, and uh, then we have another, uh, another problem. And those are, for instance, namespaces, because as we all know now, uh, namespaces in XML uh, are identified by URIs. But in each XML document, you can choose your own shortcut for that namespace URI. And uh, basically, <laughs> depending on which shortcut you use, you get a different hash of uh, on the text level. So all those are pro problems that need to be dealt with. And they are dealt with using um, the referenced standard here, the exclusive XML canonicalization. Uh, that is basically a transformation uh, of any XML document into another XML document with the same meaning, but the, the, the resulting XML document has the property that it is the same for all input XML documents with the same meaning. So basically it's a well canonicalization of the document into a form that uh, is always the same, uh, no matter uh, the variances that we discussed, such as white spaces and uh, namespaces and all that. <clears throat> so let's, let's have a look at an illustration of the problem. So here, uh, let's have an element, XML element like this. So it is element called LM1 from a namespace B example. Uh, and here the namespace shortcut is N1 for, for some reason. So this is what we have. That's the original document. Now we know that we, uh, when, when we use SOAP, we basically create XML data and we envelope the data in a SOAP body and in a SOAP envelope. So we include that XML part into the SOAP document. So let's simulate this 
uh, with the PDU uh, element here from the N0 namespace, uh, which is identified by a example. So this is an example how uh, XML data application specific can be included in a SOAP message and sent over, over the internet. Now the receiver usually uses or can use XPath, the query language for XML to actually extract the uh, application data, the LM1 element. But when they do that, they end up with this uh, element. It is the LM1 element the N1 namespace is defined and the content is not changed. So this element actually means the same thing as the original one, but we can see that there is an additional namespace declaration for the namespace coming from, for instance, the SOAP envelope. That namespace is not used within this XML doc uh, document or the, the element, but it is there. So on the text level, this would produce a different hash, which is a problem. So, when we apply the uh, canonicalization transformation to this element, we should end up, uh, um, well, well, let's illustrate it this way. When we uh, apply the canonicalization to the last element here and to the first element here, we should end up with the same um, text data that can be then um, digitally signed. So there is a standard canonical XML that deals with uh, attribute ordering white spaces uh, some UTF-8 encoding and so on, but it doesn't deal with XML namespaces. And if we want to deal with XML namespaces, in addition, we end up with the exclusive XML canonicalization. And uh, because we are in web services, and as we already know, XML namespaces are very important, uh, we will use typically the XML canonicalization, uh, the exclusive XML canonicalization whenever we need to hash a part of an XML document. Okay, this brings us back to web services security. So <clears throat> let's now try to deal with, uh, with integrity. So we all want to ensure that uh, a message that we will send from the sender to the ultimate receiver is not tampered with in process. And we all want to do that using a digital signature. So here we have uh, some, um, some uh, stock tracker uh, message, for example, and uh, there is this stock symbol element in the body. Uh, and um, we want to make sure that this message is not changed. So uh, we'll uh, note that again, in the body, we use the WSU ID element. So WSU is a utility namespace used by web service security. So it is web services uh, security utility. That's the shortcut, uh, WSU. And uh, there is this ID attribute used to actually assign IDs uh, used by web services security to various uh, parts of the XML document. So now let's focus on the header part. So we have the uh, web services security header block here. And uh, we have a binary security token here, and we have uh, the signature. Now the signature uses a different namespace, DS. That's because uh, the signature is governed by the XML uh, signature uh, standard. So it is basically another standard which uses the DS uh, namespace. So let's have a look at uh, how the signature will look like. So now we zoom in on the signature part, and what we see is this. Uh, on the top level, we see a signed info element, then signature value element, and then key info element. Um, and uh, let's now zoom in again uh, to the signed info element. We can see canonicalization method. We already know what that is. There is also signature method, and then there is a reference. Uh, <clears throat> The reference obviously references the body part that we are going to sign uh, using a URI and note that the URI points to the WSU ID element in uh, uh, attribute in the body. So this points to the part that we are going to sign. And now we have a transform and a digest method here. So uh, let's have a look at how this actually works. So first of all, uh, we apply the transform to the identified body part. So the referenced body part is the entire body um, with 
the stock symbol element and, and so on because of the ID attribute on that. So that's what we target. And we'll apply the exclusive XML canonicalization to this uh, element, resulting in something we can hash um, safely. Uh, this transform is identified in the transforms uh, element using the exclusive XML canonicalization URI. Then there is the digest method, which is basically, which identifies the hash function used to create a digest value. And then there is the digest value in the digest value element. So like this, uh, we know how the sender actually hashed or created a hash of uh, the body. And the same method can be used by the ultimate receiver to create a hash of, uh, of the body uh, to verify whether or not it was changed. Now, uh, if we send this just like this, um, it would not work because anyone could change the body part and recompute the, the digest and replace also the digest and uh, we couldn't verify anything. So now we need to sign that digest. And that's uh, when uh, the signed info element comes into play. So what we are actually going to sign is the signed info element in the signature header block. The signed info element contains the reference and the digest and all the methods used to create the digest. And it also uh, contains, uh, because we are going to sign the signed info element, we again need to canonicalize it. And we are, we are going to do that again using exclusive XML canonicalization. So we identify that in the canonicalization method uh, in the signed info element. And we'll use a specific method to create the digital signature. So that's identified in the signature method. So now we are going to canonicalize the signed info and sign it using our say SAH1. Uh, yeah, so that's actually. Uh, how this is going to be done. And we do that. Uh, we reference the key that we are going to use for uh, the signature. And the resulting signature value is in the signature value element. So now we have the body part hashed and we have the hash signed um, using, um, in this case, it's uh, the typical asymmetric cryptography. So here we basically use a public key of the ultimate receiver to create the signature. This means that only the ultimate receiver is able to verify uh, that uh, the signature still holds. And therefore, no one in the middle will be able to change, uh, change the message. So this is how um, integrity can be uh, established along the SOAP message path using uh, standard web services security. Now, this is actually used in the wild. Um, for the um, Czech students, uh, this will be probably familiar because uh, one example of uh, web services security being used is in EET, electronic registration of sales, which by the way is going to end this year, it seems. But um, for the actual registration of sales uh, in all points of sales, uh, web services, the W3C style web services and web services security was used. An example message uh, or example of a message being sent from uh, a cashier to the uh, state run uh, registry, which was based on web services, looks like this. So if you take a closer look, um, I omit the body part that contains the, uh, the money and uh, the IDs of uh, the transaction. But for now, for us, uh, the more interesting part is the uh, web services security header here. So this is from the official documentation of how uh, a registration message for, uh, for individual sales looks like. And we can see uh, the web services security header. We can see the binary security token there, and we can see the signature with the signed info, the signature value. Uh, those are, of course, a bit shortened to fit uh, in the slide, uh, but there is the signature value and the key info, which uses the public key of, um, or references the public key of the, uh, well, state-run uh, registry. And uh, we can see that the reference actually references the SOAP body using the WSU ID, and that contains the 
tržba element and, uh, and so on. So this is one uh, use case from the wild of uh, web services security used to establish integrity. So now we do not prevent uh, anyone from seeing the content of the message, but we prevent them from changing the content of the message. Let's now move on to the third use case uh, of web services security, and that is encryption. So now we all want to establish confidentiality. We will not want anyone along the SOAP message path to actually see what is in the message. And for that, we will need to um, use encryption. And therefore, we will need to use also, we will need to change the body. So in the body, we'll have some elements uh, that will be encrypted. Encrypted meaning they will be changed for uh, this encrypted data element, uh, identifying the key to be used um, for decryption and the cipher data, which will contain the encrypted data unreadable to, uh, to anyone. And uh, we'll use a, a reference list header block uh, in our web services security header, uh, pointing to all the blocks that need to be decrypted before the message can be passed to the application. Now, remember that we are on the SOAP level. So all these transformations like encrypting and decrypting and so on, they are basically done without the end application and the source application knowing about it. So you can imagine the RPC, remote procedure call that you did in the tutorials. Uh, and uh, uh, it would look exactly the same. So you would have your method that you would call and you would get the result. Uh, and the same way you didn't know basically that SOAP is being used to transmit the data, you will not know that, for instance, the data is also encrypted. Uh, like SOAP libraries and web services security libraries will take care of that for you. But uh, for us, it is important to see how this is done on the XML level. So um, there will be a, a reference list in uh, the SOAP header block, listing all the encrypted parts. And each part will have the encrypted value and uh, identification of the key that can be used to decrypt it. Uh, in this case, again, we assume that the sender and the ultimate receiver actually have a pre-shared key. And this is the identifier of that key. So. Uh, the message looking like this will arrive at the ultimate receiver. Um, the re ultimate receiver has the pre-shared key with this ID and they use it basically to decrypt the data and replace the encrypted data element with the actual decrypted XML content. Um, and when sending a message and uh, encrypting it, uh, basically we take out the part that we encrypt and replace it with the encrypted data element here. So that's, that's uh, how it works. Now, let's have another example. Uh, and uh, with this other example, we will not rely on a pre-shared key. And we will actually want to send the encryption key with the message. But because we want to establish confidentiality, this pre-shared key will be encrypted itself. Um, uh, Sorry, it's not pre-shared. It's a symmetric key used to encrypt the message and to be used to decrypt the message. Uh, it will be included in the message, but itself it will be encrypted uh, using asymmetric cryptography. So again, uh, a public-private key pairs uh, mechanism. So here uh, we can see a, a web services security header with the encrypted key element. And now uh, the encrypted key element specify the encryption method used, the key info, which is a reference to a public key basically, and the cipher data, which is the encrypted, uh, encrypted key to be used to decrypt the data. So we have an encrypted shared key um, and the receiver's public key used to encrypt the key. And the receiver will use its private key to decrypt the shared key and the shared key to decrypt the data. So it's a two-step mechanism. Uh, but like this, confidentiality can be established in a standardized way using web services security. Uh, just a side note, we have seen how a body part can be encrypted, but also a header part or header block can be encrypted itself. And then it is replaced by uh, the encrypted header, header block. Uh, but otherwise, the mechanism is the same 
And a final side note, uh, Web Services Security also deals with timestamps. So it provides a standardized way to include timestamps in your uh, web services messages. Um, and um, the recommendation here is to also sign the timestamps so that they, they cannot be tampered with. Uh, but there are special elements for created timestamp and expires timestamp and so on. So this was a quick overview of web services security, another uh, SOAP extension, basically. Um, the point being that how to deal with all those issues is standardized. There is a standard for that for W3C style web services. There is no standard such as this one for RESTful web services, which we will mention later in the course. Uh, this is not all. I will introduce uh, to you another, yet another extension, and that's web services policy. So with web services policy, uh, we'll be talking about a framework for basically specifying and attaching policies, so rules, how to behave, how to communicate with a specific web service. Um, yeah, so uh, a framework for uh, establishing those uh, for, for web services. Um, so for instance, one of those policies, uh, a specific policy can be that a message needs to be encrypted. So that's, uh, that's one specific policy. Um, that's actually a web services security policy. That's another standard uh, that deals with how to express uh, policy regarding to web services security within the web services policy framework. But now we'll talk about that framework and not about the particular policies. The framework deals with the generic rules of how to express those policies and how to attach them to the affected uh, resources such as endpoints, uh, messages, and so on. Um, so when we are going to talk about the framework, we need to establish some terminology. Uh, when we are going to talk about a policy subject, we'll talk about an endpoint, a message, a resource, an interaction. So anything to which a policy, a specific policy can be attached. When we are going to talk about policy scope, we'll talk about a collection of all policy subject, subjects to which we are going to attach some policy. The policy attachment is the mechanism of associating particular policy to a particular scope. So for instance, a mechanism how to say uh, that uh, a particular message always needs to be encrypted. Um, and uh, the policy expression is the representation of the policy in XML. So that's how an actual policy looks like in XML. Now again, policy is a rule basically. Um, and uh, within that framework, a policy uh, is a set of so-called policy alternatives, and each po policy alternative can have multiple policy assertions. So enough of this uh, generic overview, let's have a look at an example. So here we have a web services policy example. On the top level, we have the web services policy XML element. So that's the policy. Um, and as we already know, within that policy, we can have multiple policy alternatives. Um, and those alternatives need to be connected using a policy operators. So for instance, here we can see the policy operator exactly one, which means that exactly one of those alternatives needs to be applied to the subject. The subject can be an endpoint, a message, uh, an interaction, and so on. So here, We'll, uh, we are saying that this policy says that exactly one of those alternatives needs to be applied. Well, one alternative says uh, that uh, all body parts uh, of the message need to be signed. And the other policy says that all body parts need to be encrypted. So those are two different things. Uh, and the policy as a whole here says that Either the body parts need to be signed or they need to be encrypted. Not both, um, exactly one of those. Another uh, policy operator that you can see here is the all operator, which says that all 
the policy alternatives within needs to be uh, needs to be used. Uh, in th these cases, the all element contains always only one policy, so uh, that is uh, similar to uh, the case where the all element would not be there. Now, the policy once defined um, can be identified using an IRI uh, with the name attribute, or uh, the policy can uh, be uh, or can can have an IRI established, and then the policy can be referenced using uh, an IRI uh, from uh, from from another policy. So here, the first part uh, shows how the policy. Um, has the IRI assigned using the name attribute. The second part shows how a policy can be referenced. So the second part references the first part. Um, the uh, ID element here contains a relative IRI. It is relative to the document. So this presumes that the policy P1 is established or defined within the same document. If it was defined in some other document, there would be an absolute IRI here. Now, um, the policies can be quite complex because uh, we, have, uh, we can have combinations of different policies and so on. Uh, so there is something called a compact form, um, which is basically a syntactic shortcut of the more complex policy. So here, uh, for, uh, one of those shortcuts is an optional attribute that says that a specific policy alternative is optional. And it is equivalent to what is in the bottom half of the slide. And that is uh, basically that we have the exactly one operator connecting an empty policy and uh, alternative and an alternative that includes the policy. Well, that's, that's an optional policy, but it is a shortcut. There is a specific policy saying that an endpoint needs to, for instance, implement web services addressing, which is the extensions that we talked about in the first part of, uh, of today's lecture. So if you want to say that a specific endpoint needs to understand web services addressing, this is um, how uh, that can look like. Of course, in this case, it is optional. So it is more to state that the endpoint understands web services policy um, rather than uh, that web services uh, sorry, understands web services addressing rather than saying that uh, web services addressing needs to be used, uh, but it is an example of uh, a specific uh, policy that we already understand. Another more complex example is here, where we have basically, um, doesn't, doesn't really matter what exactly this policy says, it has something to do with uh, encryption, it says uh, which methods of encryption need to be uh, need to be used, um, but again, uh, it is basically an example of uh, of a shortcut um, or a <laughs> it's a note saying that uh, there is a normal form defined by the web services policy specification uh, that says how the policies can be combined. But using that normal form, the policies would be really complex. That's why we have uh, the compact form with some shortcuts. And there is one of, uh, of those shortcuts shown. And that is that uh, the exactly one um, policy has uh, directly the policy alternatives specified. Um, otherwise, according to the normal form, the whole block that we see uh, on the slide would have to be duplicated uh, because there are some rules about how many uh, alternatives can be specified um, and so on. So basically the point here, here of this example here is that the policies can be, uh, can be really complex, uh, but we won't go into specific policies uh, in the lecture or in the course. We are just showing the, uh, the framework. Um, this example shows how a policy can be defined and then uh, how it can be referenced from other policies. So the first XML element here defines a specific policy saying, for instance, that uh, uh, a signature needs to be encrypted and the tokens need to be protected and so on. So various policies, uh, and it is identified by the protection ID in the WSU ID uh, attribute. And then we have two other policies 
which again add some uh, some uh, uh, of their own, some policies of their own. But in the, in addition, they reference the first policy using a policy reference element. So in both both cases, um, they reference the first policy and then they add some uh, some more policies of the, of their own. Yeah, so like that, complex policies can be defined and reused. Uh, and um, the remaining question here is, okay, so we define our policies. How do we attach those um, to um, some objects in, let's say, WSGL? And that's uh, what uh, the Web Services Policy Attachment specification here uh, deals with. Um, so uh, and one example of attaching a policy to any XML element, basically, uh, can be using a specific uh, attribute here, policy URIs. So that attribute is part of the Web Services Policy specification, and it contains a list of URIs. Those URIs are policies that are referenced by an XML element. Uh, I'm being generic here, saying XML element. That's because those policies can apply to any uh, object in a WSGL file, for instance. But not only WSGL file, uh, it can be used in UDDI, which is a technique that we'll uh, talk about later, basically serves as a catalog of services. And in that catalog, we can also say that some service requires some policies. So uh, there is a standardized XML attribute defined that can be used to link to individual policies using their URIs. Here, we link to two policies. So the result is uh, basically a merged policy resulting uh, from the two individual policies here. Now, um, there is a second way of referencing policies. Uh, if uh, reference using that uh, attribute is not possible for some reason, and there is also a standard XML element defined, uh, a policy reference that can be used to reference specific policies. And an example uh, of an external attachment, that's another way of attaching policies to, to stuff. Uh, this is a standalone XML element. It can be published somewhere as a document, for instance. And basically, it contains two parts. It contains the policy reference, so the policy to be attached to something, and then something that it attaches the policy to, that applies to element. And in this case, it's a web services addressing endpoint reference. So this is saying that to this endpoint reference, we attach this particular policy reference. The exact mechanism of finding this attachment and applying it is application specific. The specification itself just says there are three ways of attaching policies, using an attribute, using an element, or using an external attachment. But it is a standardized way of attaching those. Now let's have a look at a WSGL file with uh, attached policies. So here um, in the WSGL description element, that's the WSGL root element with WSGL 2.0, there are two policies defined, a common policy and a secure policy. <clears throat> so they are defined in, directly in the root description element. And then from a binding, uh, there is a policy reference to the secure policy. And from service, there is a policy reference to the common policy. So like this, again, from WSGL, we can reference policies. So that's another extension of WSGL that we are talking about. We talked about the web services addressing. Now we can mix in some policies. So like this, the WSGL file actually gets quite complex. Uh, but all those uh, extensions are standardized. So if you really need that functionality, there is a standard way to do so. Uh, right. And the last thing I want to mention regarding policies is that uh, when we are talking about WSGL, um, remember that in WSGL there is like a hierarchy of things described in that WSGL file. There is an endpoint, then that endpoint references a, um, an interface, that interface references uh, operations and messages and so on, and policies can be attached to any of those. And there are rules 
um, that some policies attached to, for instance, uh, uh, binding apply also to the endpoint implementing that binding. Um, and so all those policies are then merged, creating something called an effective policy. So for instance, here we have an effective policy um, combi uh, combining two policies, one coming from an endpoint and one coming from a binding. Uh, there is this diagram explaining how exactly for each whistle element, um, the effective policy is computed based on policies defined on the individual um, individual whistle parts. So for instance, the endpoint here, that's the second row in the diagram, the endpoint effective policy is a merge of endpoint policies, binding policies, and interface policies. Um, this is not something you need to remember, uh, like the, the content of uh, this diagram. Um, it is enough to rem remember that uh, within web services policy, there is again a standard way how to compute an effective policy, which can be a merge of policies attached to various um, things in a whistle file. Right, so that's web services policy. It's a framework for attaching particular policies such as uh, <coughs> uh, security policies dealing with web services security and so on, but also other policies to things in um, Whistle or to uh, in UDDI and so on. And this brings us to the end of today's lecture. And uh, I'll leave you with um, the fact that um, there are many more web services extensions standards that deal with various uh, features of uh, what you might need when implementing W3C style web services. Um, <clears throat> The most interesting here is the web services security policy because it connects the, uh, it says how within the web services policy framework, we can make assertions that for instance, a specific web services endpoint requires um, messages to be encrypted using web services security. So it con connects the web services policy framework and the web services security specification using a policy saying that the web services security specification needs to be applied to a specific endpoint. Uh, but there are many more extensions and we will see some more extensions on the next lecture when we are talking about Beeple, which is one of those um, extensions. <laughs>